Hello, I'm Kimberly, and welcome to the weekend edition of the Native News Update. It's Friday, January 10th. Many of the stories you hear here can be found at IndianCountryNews.com. And here's the news for the day from the Associated Press and other Native News sources. As the payments are being made from the $3.4 billion Cobell settlement, more than 100 years after the trust program began, tens of thousands of American Indians who are owed money cannot be located. For months now, lawyers, specialized settlement administrators, and volunteers have fanned out across the reservations trying to track down those who are owed money. About half a million Indians are eligible for payments, which vary in amount from hundreds to tens of thousands of dollars, depending on how much income their land generated. More than 30,000 tribal members have not been located. All are owed at least $800, in many cases thousands more. The total owed to missing beneficiaries is approximately $32 million, according to Kilpatrick, Townsend, and Stockton, a law firm that worked on the settlement and is involved in locating tribal members. David Smith, a lawyer with the firm, said the large number of missing beneficiaries illustrated how the Indian Land Trust Program, administered by the U.S. Interior Department, was mishandled. The University of Oklahoma has announced it is offering Native Peoples of Oklahoma a course on the cultural traditions and current conditions of the Native American tribes who reside in Oklahoma. The course will be offered at no cost this spring semester to anyone with internet access through JNUX, an online interactive learning community at OU. Our course, the Native Peoples of Oklahoma, provides an opportunity to explore and experience the unique cultural diversity that enriches the state of Oklahoma. While the story of the native peopling of Oklahoma is not always a pleasant one and often reflects the worst of federal Indian policy, the native peoples of Oklahoma not only survived the colonial experience, but flourished. And this course provides us with an opportunity to explore their accomplishments and their ongoing contributions to our state and nation. Oklahoma is home to over 200,000 American Indian people and over 20 tribal nations. The University of Oklahoma is the academic home for many of them drawn from all over the state and all over the nation. In every department on campus, we can find leading experts specializing in the fields of anthropology, literature, film, and Native American studies, history, and just about anything else. This course wants to introduce you to many of these fields, faculty and resources, and most importantly, the stories of the Native people of Oklahoma. We'll see videos made by local filmmakers, Listen to music done by powwow drum groups, jazz artists, and hip-hop DJs. We'll read poetry, fiction, and prose from nationally renowned authors. We'll hear from spiritual leaders about the traditions they foster and the roles they play in contemporary society. And we'll see art from collections that made international impact. So that's just a start. We'll also learn about history from an indigenous perspective. And we'll find that there's much about the broader American story that we can learn from the native point of view. The same can be said for the looks we'll take into law, politics, and policy as we debate the hot topics in Indian country today, from casinos to land and water rights and economic development. This is the terrain of Native peoples of Oklahoma. My name is Daniel Swan. I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of Oklahoma and curator of ethnology at the Sam Noble Oklahoma Museum of Natural History. I'm Joshua Nelson, Assistant Professor of English at the University of Oklahoma, specializing in American Indian literature and film. So please join us as we explore the story of the native peoples of Oklahoma. Students will have access to the Sam Noble Oklahoma Museum of Natural History, the largest university affiliated museum of its kind in the nation the largest collection of Native American language curriculum and teaching materials in the world. These resources give students access to the best possible information and knowledge on these subjects, plus more Native American languages are taught for college credit at OU than any other university in the world. And OU is ranked among the preeminent institutions in the nation for the study of American Indian literature. Now through JNUX, they are able to see this course offered to anyone in the world. The 16-week course begins January 13th. For more information, you can check out jnix.ou.edu. The South Dakota Board of Regents hopes to increase the number of Native Americans who attend state colleges. The Regents plans to launch a program soon based on a study of American Indian attitudes toward higher education. 
Based on the results, they voted to create a new position at their office in Pierre for a liaison. The person will travel to schools and reservations across the state to work with high school faculty, students, and their families to encourage Native American college attendance. Some areas of focus will include smoothing the college entrance process of testing and paperwork, applying for scholarships and financial aid, preparing for the social and cultural change of campus life, and overcoming attitudes that inhibit college attendance. Native American entrepreneurs may soon get a helping hand thanks to the expansion of a nonprofit lending institution on the Cheyenne River Reservation. Four Bands Community Fund, established in Eagle Butte in 2000 to provide business loans to those who would normally be rejected by other lenders, announced that it will expand its loan program from Cheyenne River to tribal members on all South Dakota reservations. Tanya Fidler, executive director of Four Bands Community Fund, said in a press release that her institution has flexibility and patience that few other lenders do. Fidler's institution is called the Community Development Financial Institution, or CDFI, which was formed in the 1990s by the federal government. The institutions are backed with treasury dollars and have greater lending freedom than banks and credit unions. In addition to lending money, Four Bands also pairs its services with education for Native entrepreneurs about how to start and run a business. As part of the loan application process, loan recipients must finish a business development training course and submit a business plan. In a unique multi-agency project, deer from Morrow Mountain State Park in North Carolina will soon make the move in a long-term relocation project to reservation lands of the Eastern Band of Cherokee, located in the mountains of Swain and Graham counties. The North Carolina Division of Parks and Recreation is partnering in an initiative with the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, biologists from Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and the Cherokee Fisheries and Wildlife Management Program. The overall project is intended to augment the reservation's sparse population of white-tailed deer. In each of the next three years, 25 to 50 deer, primarily females and small family groups, will be relocated. Biologists from the Smokies will begin collecting the deer this month, using darts to tranquilize the animals, collecting data on age and health, and fitting each with a tag and radio collar. Cherokee wildlife personnel will transport the deer in individual crates within small trucks carrying four or five animals at a time. Once in western North Carolina, the deer will be kept in a four-acre pen on the reservation in a mix browsing areas. The deer will be closely monitored for about four weeks before being released. Cherokee Principal Chief Michael Hicks said he believes the deer re relocation project will greatly benefit the tribe's natural resources. And that's another roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Nave News Update. I'd like to thank you for joining me and have a grand day.